Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Mosh Sustainability Dialogues podcast, where we take a deeper dive into this massive push towards sustainability, towards energy transition, towards net zero, and try to uncover insights and intelligence that will help our stakeholders along their journey for the road ahead. Of course, COP28 is a big moment that is coming up on the timeline. We're tackling the critical question today of partnerships, not polarization, how to foster an industry collaboration framework throughout the energy sector to accelerate climate action. Of course, we have our host for Mashrek today, Faraz Jaramani, who is the Executive Vice President, Head of Public Sector, Aviation, Energy, Education, and Healthcare at Mashrek. And our two special guest speakers, Cornelius Mathis, CEO of DII Ener Desert Energy, and Robin Mills, CEO of Kmart Energy. Thank you both for joining the show. Uh, for us, I just wanted to first kick off with you to get your opening comments on the overall critical question that we're tackling today. It, it's a significant, uh, I would say, ch challenge that we're addressing. And of course, partnerships will help uh, progress and accelerate climate action further. Sure, thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you, Chris and Cornelius for joining us today. Uh, in fact, uh, we take pride in hosting such a uh, dialogue with the thought and industry leader in collaboration with Gulf Intelligence. Uh, we aim to continue driving and contributing to the overall discussions that are already happening regionally and internationally around the ESG agenda, bringing together the wealth of knowledge already in position by the energy industry the academia and the financial institution to foster an industry collaboration and all parties partnership and alignment. Uh, uh, we aim from this so podcast, uh, podcast series, in fact, to keep exchanging opinions and ideas about best practices, ideas, suggestions related, related to the growing partnership between the financial institutions and energy uh, industry players, as Brian said in fact the key theme here especially for us in Mashuk, is to always foster this partnership environment and ecosystem all together with all of our clients and even the next level of main players in the in the industry and around the think tank if you may say whether in the academia or consultancy services thank you again for joining us i look forward to hear all of your valuable inputs around this. Thank you for us. Cornelius, I just want to first bring you in. Of course, this is a topic that's been at the heart of, of, I would say, conversations for many years. How do we develop this framework to establish partnerships to help accelerate climate change, of course, throughout the energy sector? I just want to get your opening thoughts and opinions on the overall topic that we're addressing today. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for having me. It, it's a pleasure. Well, this is one of our slogans of partnerships, uh, you know, between people. They make uh, things happen. They can make wonders. And you always hear by different of our partners. It's all about the right partnerships. So, well, it is for sure the name of the game. And, uh, well, we've uh, created, for example, the MENA Hydrogen Alliance four years ago. An alliance is all about uh, partnerships and uh, well that's uh, that's exactly for the, need, uh, the the things we need we need partnerships between private sector between the right players international we work a lot as a bridge between the main region and europe particularly in these times of um, uh, energy insecurity for europe where europe does not only need to execute on the green deal but has a huge uh, uh, all of a sudden issue for energy security we create partnerships between private sector and government uh, to, well, to bridge, uh, uh, let's say, the, um, the, the gap um, as well. And, uh, well, in a certain way, as an independent uh, think tank, you know, to guide all the players and, uh, yeah, to, to connect again. So that is uh, really our slogan has been connecting people, connecting continents from, you know, when we started 15 years ago. Uh, and in the first few years, energy uh, transition has been kind of exotic. You know, we started 15 years ago with solar and wind in, in MENA, which was really very early, very exotic, same seven, eight years ago in hydrogen. But now things are happening. And I'm personally 
really excited and really very happy that we see this acceleration now, this uh, you know exponential growth of uh, newly installed capacity for renewables and many hydrogen projects. So uh, that's very exciting times towards COP28, which is also very special to us to have it here in the UAE. I just wanted to, to follow up to that point. You've had tremendous growth, tremendous success in developing partnerships. And of course, today is about creating that framework. Uh, from your experience, what are the first steps to creating that framework for partnerships? Uh, you, you mentioned identifying the right partnerships. What are the processes and, and, and I would say uh, work that goes into that in order to uncover some intelligence that will help our shareholders who are looking to essentially go on the same path that you've done in creating that collaboration network? Yeah, that's a very good question. I've actually lectured at universities on uh, complex stakeholder management uh, because, you know, in Desert Tech 1.0, when we started, that has been highly complex with, uh, you know, uh, 50, 60 industrial partners and so many governments involved as well. So I think, uh, well, first of all, you have to have a very high standard of integrity, a uh, good uh, code of conduct. So I think uh, in, in, in integrity, uh, and this top down, uh, you know, to to live certain values with the team, I think that's an absolute uh, prerequisite because if this is not there, then uh, you will uh, really suffer and not uh, be able to gain uh, credibility. And then, well, I, I think it's all about uh, discipline, having uh, a good a good approach. Uh, it's it's about doing your job in uh, analyzing. It's about uh, having many of the contacts to, to vet the partners. We have quite a rigid due diligence process, for example, on any new partner, uh, which uh, the partner needs to go through to uh, be, uh, first of all, uh, approved by the shareholders and brought on board. So I think that's also very important uh, to not, uh, you know, uh, save time on, on these kind of things. And then coming back to people, you know, it's all about uh, personal relationships. And, you know, I'm from Germany. I went to Italy. I realized uh, that in Italy, actually, personal relationships are much more important than Germany. Germany is really just discipline, uh, just content. And you go from Italy to the MENA region, and it's even much more important. So the MENA region being based now for, for 10 years in Dubai is all relationship driven. You know, you need to build personal relationships. You need to invest a lot of time. And I think then once you build these personal relationships as a team, then I think uh, um, things will pay off and uh, the right partnerships can be uh, developed. I could, of course, comment on many specific things now, but this was just, you know, some of the high level guidelines. Robin, I just want to bring you in. Of course, uh, we've seen so much activity throughout the UAE, throughout the region in terms of partnerships. But we're still having these conversations with stakeholders where a key aspect is the need to accelerate partnerships. And of course, His Excellency Sultan al Jaber with the statement partnerships, not polarization. I just want to get your opening comments on the overall topic that we're addressing, Robin, uh, and to see kind of where we at we are at in that perspective. Yes, yeah, so th thanks, Brian. So, uh, you know, we all know that kind of old old saying, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. Um, you know, the chance that we have here is we've got to go far and fast. So, uh, so how, how do we do that? Um, and, you know, obviously effective partnerships um, is, is a critical part of that. And we're entering, obviously, a very new and different energy business. And we're all kind of feeling our way a bit. Um, you know, new business models a much bigger and much more integrated energy industry. So the old divisions between oil and gas and electricity and renewables and so on, that, that those divisions are kind of breaking down. You see companies that are doing all of these. You see things like hydrogen, which bring together skill sets from different um, different industries, including you know, renewables, the power industry, the, uh, the, the chemicals or oil and gas related industries. You see things like carbon capture and storage, which again is a, is a link between the power sector or, or, or industrial sector and uh, and the oil and gas sector and nobody has the skills to, to do all of this um even even big integrated companies so they're all they're all finding their way and trying to develop business models um and you can do it internally and, and maybe uh, to some point you develop the skills to do a lot of this in-house um but you know developing it through a partnership is is a way to to do that much quicker and, and probably to do it in a much more effective way but th these things are not easy um and um, if you talk about things that are intimately involved in your in your core business, 
um, and again, I'll come back to carbon capture and storage in this, um, to, to operate an industrial plant, you know, a steel plant, an ammonia plant, you, you know, as an operator, you know how to do that. When you suddenly bolt on a carbon capture system and now you've got to think about the downstream and where does your CO2 go and who's storing it and when do they need it, when do they not need it, do they, ha do they have process upsets, um, how do you operate that effectively and make sure that you're still running a, a good and commercial process yourself um, while capturing the CO2. That is not an easy challenge. The technology itself is, you know, is relatively straightforward, but but using it operationally is 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 a different thing, um, and and those kind of challenges are you know repeated throughout the industry in, in all kind of other sectors, and then there's the technology side. You know, a lot of these these um these new technologies, um, people worry about new technologies. People like them and welcome them, and they all need to be. They all know we need new technologies, but they're also concerned about being the first of a kind, about being the, the guinea pig. Um, and maybe technologies that that, that look great on paper, um, but but uh, but in but in in, um, in reality prove out to be hard to use or or have other problems or you know technical problems take longer to implement or whatever. Um, so that that's a really critical thing I think is accelerating the deployment of these technologies and finding ways to work effectively together. So look, some of these technologies are actually quite well proved in certain places, um, although not maybe in the MENA region. Um, how do you bring them to the MENA region and not try and try and do it all over again? Um, but conversely, where can you improve on them in the MENA region? I think the solar sector is a great example of that. Solar was pretty well established, of course, elsewhere. Um, it came to the MENA region in the kind of early 2010s in, 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 for the first time in a big way. And, and as now, obviously, we have some of the world's biggest solar projects in this region. Um, some of that is doing what was done elsewhere, but doing it bigger and, and better and faster. Some of it was genuinely kind of innovative stuff. Um, particularly if you've got the financing side, a, a critical part of driving down costs. Um, so, you know, there's, there's also things that can be done effectively in this region where, where this region has, has, has in the relatively recent uh, past become a world leader. I want to touch on technology and scaling up in a bit and the impact of partnerships, but I want to go back to, of course, a point that you made uh, about partnerships. You've mentioned a lot of dynamic aspects that are going on at the moment. It's a massive challenge. From a framework perspective and a narrative and I would say private sector perspective, are we too much in a linear uh, view on things? Progression isn't always linear. Target A, target B, target C. Um, are we taking that approach too seriously? Do we need to loosen that approach up and understand that dyna dynamic aspects is what drives innovations? Let's say the U.S. shale boom in the U.S., of course, with sustainability in the Middle East. Um, do you think that that linear approach that we're, we're tackling things at in terms of frameworks is hindering or do you think it's actually a, a positive for partnerships? You know, that's a very good question and a good way of framing it, I think. Um, I've got to answer and say it's a little bit of both. The, the way I look at it is, is kind of t two ways. The first way is to say, look, we need targets, we need pathways, we need trajectories, right? We have a 2050, in the, if we take the UAE, we have a 2050 net zero goal. Um, and uh, you know, that's still 27 years away. That's long enough to have some time to think about it. But you have to be doing stuff today. Um, so you, you have to say by 2030, you need to be well on, on, on the road to that net zero. Some of that is actually reducing emissions. Some of it is laying the groundwork um, in terms of building networks, in terms of building partnerships, building companies and business models, building critical bits of infrastructure that, that you will use later and, and that you will, you, will, that you will expand on. Um, so, you know, it's no good to, 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 uh, to uh, and I think this goes for every country in the world, you know, it's no good to set a 2050 net zero target and then think that that means you don't do anything for, uh, you know, for the next 10 years. Um, and we have over the past decade or two been, indeed, been laying a lot of this groundwork, building up a solar industry and, uh, and a wind industry and an EV industry and, and so on, which is now reaching critical mass. So that's that's kind of my first thought. That yes, you do need these targets to guide you and trajectories. But on the other hand, I think you also need to look at these there's very non-linear dynamics in this system. And again, we see this in the renewable energy sector. For a long time, renewables are you know they're small scale, they're expensive, they're niche things, um, but they are they're building scale. And you know and and if you're in the industry and you watch carefully, you can see they're getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Suddenly, they become competitive on a mass scale, and the adoption increases incredibly quickly. And we're probably at that point for EVs. We're probably getting that point for certain kind of batteries. Um, hydrogen is not there yet, but you know, hopefully hydrogen will, will, will be there when we have a few large scale projects in the next few years. Um, and then, then the dynamics change. 
and and we get in this non-linear phase where when the engine engine is overturned very quickly and everything changes. Cornelius, I just wanted to bring you back in on on that point of technology. Um, you know, we had comments this week with our stakeholders in the region about uh, the amount of money that you know was needed five years ago to invest in technology has now increased, but the comment essentially was because we didn't accelerate enough five years ago. That's why the investment has to increase in order to meet our targets. In terms of technology and partnerships, what are the current obstacles that you're seeing uh, in terms of deployment, as Robin was saying? CCUS, hydrogen, they're, they're big aspects, of course, of tackling climate action. Um, but it still seems that we're still at that first point phase for mass adoption, mass deployment. Uh, in, your, in your perspective, what barriers can be removed? What incentives can be in, put into place in order, in order to achieve the goals that we're trying to, to reach? Yeah, it's a good question. So particularly Dubai has done a good job already in diversifying the economy. Uh, Abu Dhabi is obviously still a bit more oil based. Uh, Saudi is, but since MBS took over, is on a very fast way now to completely overhauling and diversifying the economy in this decade. It's uh, pretty impressive actually what's happening in a short time. So I think uh, there is a few good um, examples. So looking at startups, for example, technology, uh, we, we want to talk about new technologies as well and creating the right startup ecosystem. When I uh, was, uh, you know, among the first investors in Dubai, angel investors, a fund we launched as a micro VC in 2016, there was almost no ecosystem for startups in Dubai. But in less than 10 years, uh, a massive startup uh, ecosystem has developed. Uh, you know, with the fund, we made 38 investments. And this, uh, the world has completely changed. Um, not so much yet. Unfortunately, we see not as many uh, green tech companies uh, as we could. That's a huge opportunity. That's the largest investment opportunity, I think, in history anyway. And now I think uh, in the next uh, wave, and Saudi has uh, even faster caught up on startup uh, environment, for example. The next phase is now that uh, the UAE need to, I think, to continue to create a framework which uh, helps uh, to attract uh, R&D and uh, new technologies. And I think particularly on the green tech side, it's a huge opportunity. But uh, yeah, quite a few things uh, need to happen from a regulatory point of view. Uh, certain things improved as well for SMEs, for startups, but there's still also a way to go. So let's say attractiveness of doing business UAE has improved, but there's uh, many measures that need to be taken. And uh, I don't have any doubt that the UAE showed uh, leadership on the solar side, as uh, Robin mentioned before, you know, from starting just with a bit of marketing uh, in just 10 years, you know, from building some of the world's largest solar plants at the world's lowest prices, by the way, that's pretty impressive. That the next phase will be now to attract new technologies. And uh, yeah, value chains are getting more complex. Uh, hydrogen is a super complex value chain. There's also all the application sides. And uh, this is uh, the opportunity. And this is also the next phase. And for example, also with uh, our partners, uh, with Fraunhofer, we are working on, uh, you know, ideas on how to create, uh, let's say, uh, a technology, a uh, technology sharing hub as well between the UAE and Germany. There will be more uh, news to come on that but i think that's really the name of the game where we all need to work together and also particularly government needs to come in to create uh, to to improve let's say the the conditions and the framework uh, to uh, you know to make this possible for us i just wanted to to bring you in on that in terms of financing getting your perspective from a mosh point of view accelerating that sme ecosystem and of course accelerating energy transition uh, just to, to get your insights on on where we're at from that perspective and how you see things moving forward oh, sure thank you now look uh, Mashraq, uh, especially in this part of the world and even in some of our network countries has been a leading financial institution in terms of supporting sustainability linked financing activities to our clients whether on the public or private side uh, Mashraq has pledged already $30 billion of ESG-linked financing between now or between last year and 2030, so in a span of eight years, basically. Uh, uh, we are a participant and an active supporter of the COP28 
uh, in terms of all the activities around it. So we like to see ourselves as in the mid, as an institute that is in the middle of all the drive towards ESG linked uh, uh, financing and opportunities around the, the region and even beyond. Now, in terms of uh, what we are looking for or what Mashraf is doing. Now, as the gentlemen have already suggested, uh, the, the ESG linked entities are uh, scattered around different spectrum of, uh, of sizes, uh, geographies and requirements. What we have seen and from our prospect as a financial institution, time is playing to the side of the, let's put it this way, the ESG linked entities and technologies, time is on their side. Time on their side in terms of technology, time's on their side in terms of track record. And as you all are aware, any financial institution, especially when tackling opportunities presented by new technologies, they would always want to see some track record on the back of the entities that are either performing the projects or involved in the technology aspects on the projects. This, while I think Cornelius have touched on this, seven years ago, it was non-existent in this part of the world, not only in terms of funds and SMEs, but in general as a track record of projects that are visible in this area, it was very less. As of now, in fact, it, it has become more of a regular happening that we are presented with opportunities coming from entities that are presenting a track record of five to ten years in the region. This is helping a lot in terms of risk assessment, in terms of the entire background of the financing opportunity. This is even helping us not only in looking at funding and financing ourselves, this is helping us in reaching out to other investors and financial institutions to arrange for the required funding. We have seen and like an increased level of interest coming from our clients and some, sometimes even client uh, uh, corporates that are not yet clients uh, asking or raising questions about what can we do to coordinate uh, uh, setting up a framework and uh, an ESG policy for those entities. Uh, we are talking about entities that you can be classified as small even not SMEs, small entities, all the way to very large entities. We have worked on, uh, maybe this was a private deal, but uh, it was covered intensively in the media. We have we have led the transaction on Babco in Bahrain. We were one of the leading banks. Uh, we acted even as a coordinator of their uh, KPIs and setting up KPIs and policies. So we have, as, of, as my starting point, time is on the side of this part of the industry in terms of technology, in terms of uh, evolving counterparts, uh, frameworks, policies, and track records. We are happy to see this and we are happy to play even an, an ever expanding role on that. Robin, I just wanted to bring you back in on that, that point of regulations, the, the environment that's being created, of course, to accelerate what we're, we're trying to achieve. Where do you see the current state of regulations, of course, in the Middle East? Um, specifically, what would you recommend in terms of the next steps that have to be implemented in order to create an environment that incentivizes partnerships to accelerate more, to accelerate climate action? And to achieve essentially, at the end of the day, net zero goals that have been established. What are the next steps specifically that you think have to be put into place? Obviously, it varies a lot across the MENA region. Um, you know, some countries have have regulatory schemes already that are relevant, uh, and 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 some don't yet. Um, I think I'd point to a few key things. Um, one, I think, is you know there are some new, new and nascent and kind of emerging sectors that need regulation. And that regulation does not have to be very complicated and, and, and very prescriptive. It just needs to be there to give investors confidence. And I think CCS and, and hydrogen are, are two of those. To some extent, perhaps they're already regulated under existing kind of oil and gas uh, uh, authorities or under you know, safety standards and so on. That should just be harmonized and make sure it's all appropriate for, that, for those industries. Um, there are, of course, good regulatory schemes elsewhere in the world. 
um, that can be that can be adopted or adapted. It doesn't need to be a lot of kind of rethink. It just needs to be there. So if you're a, an American company, a European company, Japanese company coming into this sector in 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 the Middle East, you can see that yeah, there's a regulatory framework, and and I know where I stand. Um, so I think that that kind of goes to the kind of new and emerging industries. Um, I think there are other sectors, and I look at the power sector in particular, where you know there is a lot of regulation already, but it needs to be thought: is it fit for purpose? Is it really supporting our goals of decarbonisation, um, or is it just really kind of made for for an, for an old world that is, that is that, that's not with us anymore? Um, I think there's a lot a lot of room for the power sector to be to be more dynamic, um, to be more open to to outside involvement, outside investment, and particularly when you think about things obviously like solar. You know, rooftop solar has 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 developed very well in Dubai. Um, not really been adopted in much of the rest of the region yet. Um, that, that seems like you know a missed opportunity, particularly for kind of in industrial large commercial customers. Um, so you know, what, why are regulations not not sufficiently supporting supporting that, for example? Um, so I would look at things like that. You know, I think we're, we're going to enter a more dynamic market um, in which which you will have. You know, we, you know, Europe, of course, for many years we talked about prosumers uh, who, who create, who both produce electricity and and consume it. Um, there's a lot more room to do things like, like like that here and have and bring in investment into the sector, into the, the power power and water sector more dynamically. In order to identify where those opportunities are in a dynamic market, of course, transparency, accountability, and reporting and monitoring have to probably play a role, so you can see where those corridors are. Uh, where do you see the current state of accounting, transparency, reporting, and monitoring uh, in the energy sector? Is there enough emphasis being put onto that, or do we still have a lot of ways to go in order to progress in that space? You know, that's an important issue too. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of the key companies involved in, in the sector are, um, Nowadays, they are listed companies. They're, you know, usually primarily, predominantly state state owned, but they do have listed uh, some kind of listed listed uh, entity. Um, so there is a reporting requirement. Um, I think so. First step, you know, harmonising that reporting standards, making that consistent with international reporting. Um, so you know, and this will be particularly important when we come to things like Europe's carbon border tariff. Um, companies here will have to demonstrate that they they properly, uh, if they want if they want to export a green product or they want to to declare a carbon footprint, they have to be able to, be able to clearly demonstrate and certify what, what that is. Um, if they want to attract outside investment, they want to attract international shareholders, um, international debt financing, you know, again, they need to they need to demonstrate these things. And then, of course, you've got the, the companies that remain 100% state-owned. Um, you know, perhaps the, the, the pressure on them for disclosure is not so strong right now, but I think it's it's even for them, it's it's important to, to start thinking about and start disclosing more. Ad hoc, of course. Adnoc Parent uh, is not listed, but Adnoc Parent has uh, disclosed a certain amount about its carbon footprint and, and emissions reduction strategies and so on. Um, but I think you know, build, building on that and 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 for other state companies to to disclose more, it's not traditionally been something they do, but it's something that that, that they will have to do. Cornelius, I just want to get your your thoughts on on that topic as well. Of course, in order to establish uh, efficient partnerships. Uh, transparency reporting monitoring comes into play. Can you just give your your advice from your experience on what the first steps organizations can do in order to get to that that essential goal of monitoring reporting where they're at and then the steps after that in order to take advantage and leverage that for success for their targets? Yeah, there's quite a way to go. I think on the transparency side, that's uh, a super important uh, issue, but uh, yeah, uh, I think the international companies with a significant presence in the region, they were kind of uh, leading the way because obviously they, they need to report internationally, often they are listed uh, companies. Uh, yeah, there is some good, um, let's say, examples of, uh, of improvements, but of course, Compared to Europe or other regions, I think there is huge uh, potential uh, for uh, improvement. And uh, yeah, uh, we, in terms of regulatory improvements uh, or some of the things, let's say also towards COP, um, let me maybe mention the fact that we still have uh, substantial fossil fuel subsidies in some of the countries in the region. The UAE was the first to phase out completely in 2015, so eight years ago. But some even that have uh, net zero targets at the same time do have fossil fuel subsidies, 
which obviously completely undermines your credibility because how can you incentivize the waste of energy and at the same time have a net zero target? This, uh, this is completely contradictory. So I think that could be one of the expectations we, we get out of COP to improve the framework in this respect. What would be almost a, a small revolution and highly symbolic is even if um, the UAE, for example, said we are the first country to imp uh, to introduce a price uh, for carbon. You know, uh, let's say taxing all harmful emissions in the region. That would be a game changer because then you know if you if you pollute, if you emit harmful emissions, and this uh, all of a sudden has a has a price and even a small one, hopefully increasing uh, gradually. This would. Uh, yeah, be a small revolution. You you create immediate business cases, and uh, yeah, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies obviously creates a level playing field and introduce the price of carbon. I think that would be very interesting. Um, and uh, if you look at the voluntary offsetting, uh, and again coming to transparency, there have been a few initiatives uh, between Saudi UAE. There's also a carbon exchange in Abu Dhabi, but uh, rightly. Voluntary offsetting is uh, is in a big crisis currently because uh, there is a complete lack of transparency, credibility, and I think we we need to overhaul this completely because uh, the spirit uh, of of voluntary offset is is good one. It makes a lot of sense. It helps also projects where you reduce uh, harmful emissions. You know you can securitize, for example, future cash flow out of this. Uh, there's uh, there's many ways to do so. But rightly, uh, due to intransparency, it is, in some instances even fraud, uh, uh, you know, that's that's all a learning case. Even CDM in Europe went through uh, difficult times. But uh, yeah, it's important to take the right conclusions to improve transparency dramatically. And then, yeah, uh, I think this, uh, this is an interesting new field where many players come in now. But uh, I think there's no more place to hide in the future. You know, technology enables us to monitor, let's say, very rigidly all uh, progress, all developments. And uh, I think it's it's very important for companies to have a solid strategy because any sort of greenwashing, I think, will for sure backfire. So I would ever advise everybody to be extremely careful of this because that's a thing which uh, yeah will uh, will be really scrutinized over the next few years. Uh, Cornelius, I just wanted to shift gears, but touch on a point that you briefly mentioned earlier, which is talent, which is the bedrock for future partnerships and, of course, getting the future generation to where, where we want to get it, essentially, to achieve our targets. Uh, we have a lot of conversations across the region that the sustainability talent it's still hard to find at the moment. It's always an evolving dynamic and environment. What can we do as the private sector in order to help upskill that talent and, uh, and essentially close that gap between academia and industry to, to help the next generation get to where we need it to be today to reach our goals tomorrow? Yeah, actually, there's a lot of talent. Uh, we started uh, with DI in 2010 to introduce a so-called best paper award, where we, uh, you know, work together with universities in, in North Africa and the Middle East to uh, to look at, uh, you know, some of the best post master thesis and dissertations on uh, topics all across uh, the emission-free value chain. You know, from renewable generation, grid topics, uh, uh, storage, whatever, and I was personally surprised that even 13 years ago when we introduced this, uh, there was a world of uh, knowledge, uh, an amazing pool actually of young motivated students uh, and this long ago. The pool is even bigger, you know, I'm an investor in some uh, energy transition startup companies in the region and there's different universities, even the UAE, that have an amazing uh, pool. But of course, there's always room for improvement, you can always do more. So. Uh, well, you can have different programs where universities work uh, closer with private sector. You can work on uh, different sort of uh, competitions. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, for example, as universities as well, develop certain tools. Uh, for example, a book on the best students, which is shared with, uh, with companies. Uh, so there is for sure also potential to introduce more energy transition studies like on the complexity of uh, the hydrogen value chain, as we studied before, there's of course uh, so many different uh, uh, studies in, in Europe internationally that uh, that could uh, 
you know, be introduced potentially in the region where you can uh, develop uh, new centers of excellence in addition to the very good ones already present. Ross, I just wanted to get your perspective on that younger generation. Uh, of course, it's it's a younger generation that's very driven towards sustainability. They'll be the future leaders who are creating these partnerships. Uh, where does finance, what's the key role of finance play in that younger generation's education, upskilling to getting to become a future sustainability leader? How crucial is the understanding and role of finance play in their journey uh, moving forward? That's a very good question. In fact, uh, I think this uh, this idea uh, can be can be discussed today with uh, some sort of a look back on what most of the financial institutions have gone through over the past six to ten years, when majority of the banks decided to have their own dedicated uh, ESG departments, whether on the advisory side or or the execution side. And majority of the financial institutions were uh, a bit short on resumes in terms of candidates who can who can be shortlisted for the, these positions. And most of the positions were filled from relevant people who needed to be trained on the role or on the job. This was the case, say, 10 years ago. However, again, this is an evolving matter, not only in the business circles, not only in the technology uh, side of it, but even on the educational side of it, now it's it has become uh, very common to hear between even the sons and daughters of our friends and relatives that some of them they are majoring in ESG related subjects, whether on the energy side or even on the technology side. In fact, it has become more topical than than the usual uh, uh, doctor engineer discussion in most of the cases, right? Uh, we expect that over the coming three to five years, you will see now increasing number of people who are heading this direction with the also blossoming of the advisory service companies, the execution companies, uh, and uh, with the opening up of full dedicated divisions at the existing, let's say, auditing firms and the management consultancy firms. All of this is contributing to uh, training and qualifying people for this part of, of the business. So the what used to be a short supply 10 years ago has been eased uh, significantly over the years. And as of now, in fact, I don't think that financial institutions are facing such shortages. Unfortunately, uh, 30 minutes goes by pretty quickly, but I just wanted to do another quick round of short closing comments. We have COP28 coming up. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a big moment, but one moment in a long journey that we still have you know, moving forward. Robin, I just wanted to first go to you for your closing comments. What are, what are the outcomes that you're expecting from COP28, global stock take, uh, in terms of partnerships? What, what is your hopes and ambitions from the event that's coming up? Well, I think the um, the grand kind of political declarations that, that will come out of COP uh, to me they're kind of less important. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about making this a COP of implementation, and that's what I would hope to see. I think there are some very practical issues. There's issues like unlocking some climate finances on, which which is important. Um, but I think there are also some practical things around uh, further defining the rules for industrial carbon trading. You know, as, as Cornelius uh, referred to, um, that that could really. Uh, uh, if it's done right, could really uh, unlock a lot of finance. Um, I think getting some critical things, obviously there's a target, to, hopefully there'll be a target for tripling renewables um, by 2030, but I think it would be great to go beyond that and say, why are we not seeing enough renewables in certain countries, in Africa in particular, um, which have great potential? What can we do? And, and partnerships are obviously a key part of that. So what can, so let's say, the UAE or other Middle East countries do um, in terms of investing further in Africa alongside alongside their partners? and and getting finance into African countries. Um, that's a really critical thing I, that I would look for. And then I think there are specific partnerships on tackling certain issues, um, like the Global Methane Partnership, for example. Um, there can be others that, that are focused on particular climate issues, which are, are kind of amenable to, to a relatively small group of countries that can get together and, and work together and, and have, a, have a, a major impact um, on, on a particular issue. So, you know, methane is one, but there, there are others as well. 
Cornelius, I just want to hand it to you as well for your closing comments. COP28, what outcomes are you looking for and what are your hopes in terms of the next steps? The, um, the, the climate uh, uh, finance, or let's say a mechanism in which uh, developing countries can uh, execute projects at uh, uh, long term interest rates similar to the developed world. I think that would be a game changer. And, you know, 2009 uh, COP in Copenhagen uh, promised uh, the 100 billion dollars uh, dispersed every year. Very little happened. And it is used to uh, due to perceived risk and extremely high cost of financing, uh, which are probably 40% of the levelized cost of electricity. So, uh, creating probably even a new institution like the president of Kenya always uh, uh, says would be really a game changer and to have you know sort of soft concession loans for the developing world the chipping initiative absolutely as robin said we were one of the co-signature choice for this that's that's a big thing but with a concrete implementation plan any announcement i think will need to have a very concrete plan because otherwise it will be stay an announcement or it will it's just a greenwashing uh, on the fossil fuel subsidies and i mentioned a clear road to finally and quickly phase this out possibly introduce a price for carbon. I think uh, these are, from my point of view, uh, would be uh, big uh, decisions and big developments. I just want to hand it back to our host, of course, for us, for your closing comments to uh, round out the session and your expectations for COP28. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Cornelius. Thank you, Ropen, for joining us on this podcast today. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, I have learned a lot today. I have received lots of interesting views and ideas about you. I can see uh, even more positiveness about what's coming, coming from both of you. I know that both uh, have highlighted the challenges and what the expectations should be, whether on from regulators, uh, governments, or the corporate uh, world. Uh, Hopefully things are going and will continue to go on the right direction from all sides. We can see that from the Middle East part of the world and especially the GCC and the Emirates, things are evolving very rapidly, even on the regulator side, the financial institution side, and uh, henceforth, we expect a very exciting future and more focus on the ESG agendas. From financial institutions, Mashraq remains committed to work and partner with the stakeholders on the corporate side and regulators around our role and expanding our role in supporting this agenda, uh, whether on the advisory side or the financing side, uh, even on the side of developing human resources, as you alluded to, Brian. We are already running internship programs, and part of it are dedicated for our ESG department. So we will continue as Mashiach to play our role. We'll take our fair share, and uh, we will continue to support the global and national agendas in terms of becoming closer to our KPIs overall. Well, I think that wraps up our podcast for today, of course. Uh, thank you for us as the hosts from Mostrek and Cornelius and Robin for your excellent insights and intelligence. For all those who are listening, please feel free to follow Mostrek on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, we'll be posting this podcast and content harvested from it. But thank you very much, everyone, for your insights. We appreciate your time and we look forward to welcoming you back in the future on another podcast.